Thank you very much indeed. Uh, welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm really delighted to be uh, chairing this lecture, not least because I'm really looking forward to the, uh, the lecture, which is Becoming First or Nearly First Among Equals, the Evolution of European uh, Employment Equality Law in Ireland, and hearing uh, 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 Ms Justice Bulger speak on this topic. I'm going to introduce her in a few moments, but before I do that, the other reason I'm just delighted to be here is because I, I, I really think that this is a great lecture series, and I'm delighted to be part of it. Um, I mean, it's obviously named after the great Adrian Hartman, um, but also just the, the thought that goes into um, uh, you know listing and deciding on the topics in this lecture is really great. And, I'm, I'm always slightly envious when I hear of the people going to it. And I know we're all invited, but somehow you never get time. So this has forced me to make the time, and I'm really delighted to be here. But as I said at the beginning, I'm really delighted because it's a really a, a special speaker we have here today. I mean, I think we have, you know, the, the, the leading expert in, uh, in Ireland uh, on this whole area of employment uh, equality law. Not only is she um, a distinguished author in this area, uh, having uh, authored or co-authored, I think, uh, Employment Equality Law and Sex Discrimination Law in Ireland, but her uh, practice at the bar um, is very much involved in employment law and equality law in general. Um, as a senior counsel, she co-founded and chaired the Employment Bar Association, and um, she also co-edited the Irish Employment Law Journal. Um, and as an aside here, it says she served on the board Irish Council for Civil Liberties, um, which I'm delighted as well because I was involved with that at that one stage. And anybody out there who's uh, interested in doing something, um, you know, uh, with their legal knowledge that isn't directly practicing as a lawyer, um, you could all get involved in that as well. So that's a plug for that. But now, as most of you know, uh, uh, Judge Butler has been appointed a High Court judge. He's been a High Court judge since January uh, 20. 22, and um, she is sitting in the non-jury um, judicial review list at the moment. But as I say, really looking forward to this talk, so please. Thank you, Judge Donnelly. Um, and just to echo Judge Donnelly's words, I'm delighted to be here and to be part of this programme. I, I sometimes think uh, people like you will think uh, some more senior people like us, a little bit gushing when we talk about how terrific programme it is and how uh, but I really can say I wish it had been around in my day. Um, I'm not sure if I would have got onto it because as far as I can see, it's very much the brightest and the best to get onto it. But it's a terrific opportunity. I've had the pleasure of having one of you join me this week. And I've seen you just with him how uh, really you're really taking it on board and using every opportunity that comes your way. So I couldn't advise you strongly enough. You know, keep taking that sort of approach as you move towards developing your careers in law, take up every learning opportunity every opportunity to expand your knowledge, expand your understanding and perhaps benefit from the, those who have gone ahead of you who maybe just maybe have a little bit of knowledge and experience that you can learn from and in turn pass on to the next crew who come behind you. So the, my topic today is, as Jamie said, it's very much an area, uh, an area that I was interested in from the outset. I, I actually did my a thesis on it with um, Jerry White in, in Trinity, and I remember at the time kind of thinking, well, it's not really all that interesting, and then really sort of uh, getting into it and uh, getting very engaged with it. So it has been a topic of interest to me for many, many years. I, I, I spend most of the time allocated to me explaining why I found it so interesting, but it is an area, obviously, that it's very much about the law, very much about the constitution, European law, statutory law, covers all of that. But at the same time, it's almost political in terms of its significance. And what I want to talk to you about today is how it has evolved. And this isn't just a sort of a lecture in legal history. It's not the sort of them were the days. And I have to say, sometimes that can be a little, a little repetitious. The sort of, you know, well, I was first to want to do this, and first to do that, you know, way, way back then. It's relevant. It's it. But that's not what I'm looking at here, not the sort of, oh, you never guess what we have to put up with sort of thing. It's more about how this area of the law has evolved 
But the reason it's important for you to understand that is because you need to understand its evolution in order to understand how it works and fits in today. And it's not just equality law, it's also in terms of how employment law has evolved, but actually I would say this is more about a reflection of how European law has heavily impacted not just Irish law, but Irish society. We tend to think of Ireland having been dragged, kicking and screaming to equality, and I'll go into that in a little more detail. But the, the really sweet part of this story is that actually, ironically, there came a point, so initially, when equality law started to develop, it was hoisted on us by our membership of the European Union back in 1973. As soon as we joined the Union, more started happening in terms of developing Irish employment equality law or even equality law that had happened pursuant to the Constitution over many decades previously. So our membership of the European Union was this catalyst that forced us to change. Remember, the year we joined the European Union was the year that finally a woman did not have to give up her job in Ireland simply because she was <coughs> not able to get married and think she could also maintain a career. So, you know, that's pretty shocking when you think about that. Um, so, but for whatever reason, and you, you know, again, you could write a sociological thesis on it, as things evolved, we actually then became this, this very enthusiastic proponent of using European law to really progress uh, uh, national law. Uh, particularly sexual harassment, pregnancy, and extending the grounds of discrimination. So really the theme of this is we were dragged kicking and screaming, but then having been dragged into this equality sphere effectively against our national will, uh, we then became enthusiastic about it and became quite a trailblazer in developing principles even as recently as this week, and I'll bring it to that uh, momentarily. Uh, so, what I want to do is look firstly at equality, what we mean by equality, look at how equality has been treated in the Constitution. Now, in terms of jurisprudence, certainly in terms of employment equality, as soon as we joined the European Union, the, the Irish lawyers stopped, for good reason, even trying to use Article 41 to progress uh, employment equality or anything that European law touched on, because it would be pretty hopeless up to then. But of course, it's still it still arises today in other areas, it's still a really important piece of the Constitution, so it's hugely important to understand uh, how that, what its origin was, what inspired it, and why it has been generally quite restrictively applied. And I want to look then at the development of equality as a fundamental principle in European law, again, a little bit of the history lesson, but again, to understand how it evolved within the treaty and ultimately came to be recognised as a, a, a kind of a cornerstone fundamental right within in a union that was initially completely about economics rather than about social progress. So looking firstly at what does equality mean? Um, and of course, it's something that is, is spectacularly simple, but remarkably complex. And any of you in this room who have siblings will know that every child who has ever complained about their sibling being treated better than they were instinctively understands what equality means. But it's also something that is quite difficult to conceptualise in the legal and political level. So you have the Aristotle principle that equality requires those that are alike should be treated alike, those that are different should be treated differently. And that's what we call formal equality. And historically, I mean, way, way back historically, formal equality would have been used quite effectively by women to challenge uh, suffrage, uh, uh, education, and to some extent, employment. But increasingly, it was recognized that it is completely limited. It depends on uh, uh, how we determine what is alike, what is different, what forms of difference are legitimate, and which are not and very limited in dealing with people who have different needs and uh, uh, different abilities. So generally, if you think about it like a race, formal equality will deal with equality of outcome. So you start at the race and you're all at the same stage. You need a more substantive form of equality to, to deal with equality. Sorry, formal equality will deal with equality of opportunity. So you give everyone the same opportunity to participate in the race but you need a more substantive form of equality in order to have any prospect of equality of outcome. 
So substantive equality will look beyond uh, equality being premised around the norm of a person who is born and identified male, uh, white, able-bodied, heterosexual with a Judeo-Christian background. That's your pretty much norm for formal equality. And as we all know, that doesn't even begin to represent so, so many people, not least being 51% of the population that are, are female. And again, work for that person is, is structured around the assumption that they've had access to a good education. That whole sort of economic equality piece that is still very, it's out there in very much early days. Uh, they're not subject to conscious or unconscious bias. Uh, they have their children and domestic responsibilities looked after by other people. So that's never going to achieve real equality. And substantive equality is about recognising that sometimes special treatment is required in order to achieve fairness, in order to, to give someone even the chance of equality of outcome. Classic example of that would be paternity leave. So a woman becomes pregnant, therefore needs time off work with a guarantee that she will be able to return to her job, uh, possibly paid maternity leave, that's uh, somewhat exists to some extent, but even the basic idea of the entitlement to take time off without that uh, uh, damaging the ability to return to work and uh, uh, the right to, to equal treatment in the workplace despite of having the capacity to, to want to have children and maintain a career. Um, other circumstances, historical disadvantage, racism, structural discrimination, embedded prejudice, uh, differing physical or intellectual abilities, whether through disability or age, are all things that may require special treatment in order to ensure equality of outcome. And generally, prior to our membership of the, of the European communities, Irish law would have tended to focus heavily on formal equality, but certainly European equality law has moved us into much more of a realm of uh, uh, equality of outcome. So looking at the Constitution, Article 41, as you all know, provides that all citizens shall, as human persons, be held equal before the law. It shall not be held to mean that the state shall not in its enactments in due regard to differences of capacity, physical and moral, and of social functions. So that concept of equality is a fairly impressive pedigree going back to the French Declaration of the Rights of Man in 1793. Closer to home, if you look at the proclamation, the 1916 proclamation, that includes a commitment to equality that is powerful in its simplicity and simply says that the Irish Republic in 1916 guaranteed equal rights and equal opportunities to all of its citizens. And in fact, as many of you know, have looked at uh, the, in your studies of constitutional law, the 1920 constitution, that was actually a much more progressive piece on equality that ultimately found its way into the current constitution. So whilst the principle of equality is given what at first glance looks like quite a, a position of importance in the 1937 Constitution. In practice, the state's commitment to equality is, is, is really notional rather than real. I sometimes think that the, the ability to proclaim equality came a lot more easily to the leaders in 1916 than the ability to promote equality came to their political descendants. During the Doyle debates on the Constitution, Amy de Valera described Article 41 as recognising the impartiality of judicial behaviour and the principle that legislation should not discriminate between classes. Now, both perfectly laudable principles in themselves, but it seems that he really only intended to protect civil and political equality, and he believed that social equality should be left to the Iraqis. And in fact, he was vehemently opposed to including the words without distinction on grounds of sex, he, he, um, because he felt that that was objectionable and unnecessary. Now, spectacularly, in spite of freely professing those views, uh, in spite of his constitutional imposition of the position of women in the home, he quite strongly denied that the 1937 Constitution was intended to, to weaken the position of women or interfere with their rights. Now, in spite of his views that it was the greatest thing out, it, it fairly soon became apparent, apparent that Article 41 was unlikely to progress the position of women or minority groups in Ireland 
and it was used successfully on occasion, but primarily around um, protecting the individual against certain forms of prejudice, didn't really address inherent inequalities that exist in social structures, and in fact on occasion was used to justify the exclusion of women from civic and work spaces. There was a, a huge reluctance to engage with the principle of equality in the socio-economic sphere, and in fact, Generally, and these are some generalizations, so there has been, particularly in more recent times, some quite radical applications of the principle of equality, including a, a decision Mr. O'Donnell uh, talked about the, uh, the, the attributes of a republic, um, and the sort of republican, as in the notion of equality within a democratic republic. So, on occasion, you'll see some very radical, impressive uh, analysis of the of the principle, the, the equality, the guarantee of equality, but generally where it came into conflict with any other constitutional values, the other constitutional values were favoured, such as the role of the family, social order, <coughs> religious, <coughs> religious beliefs. So a great example is the O'Brien case, only in 1984, we, not that long ago, um, where the uh, uh, succession rights were excluded for non-marital children and that was upheld in order to protect the family based on marriage. So equality clearly fell behind the desire or what the court saw as the need to protect the family based on marriage. Um, a great case that I think illustrates this really well is a 1972 decision again only a year before we joined the European Union and everything changed. A case of merger properties and theory and it's a case that any of you who have studied employment law will probably have come across, but it's one of these cases that's really worth a sort of a second look. Because what happened in Martin Graffles and Cleary, it was a picket, it was a picket that was placed on a bar, and the owners of the bar had employed women to work as bar assistants. And at the time, the trade union, unfortunately the trade union movement in Ireland has been very progressive, very strong in some areas, but historically there were a number of unions who were men, men only, adaptively excluded women. And, and again, just to remind you, this is 1972, before this was illegal. It obviously sounds like regions now, but it was 1972, pre-membership. There was nothing unlawful about this. So the union didn't like the fact that, and of course, in fairness to the union, uh, they were non-union members, but, but of course, the women couldn't join the union. So you've got a number of things going on there, the notion of non-union members, and we will pick it a non-union business because we believe in the rights of the union. But the problem is the union itself was inherently discriminatory in refusing to allow women to join the union. So they placed a picket on the premises on the basis that the business was employing non-union labour and the company sought to rely on the women's right to equality under the constitution to assert their right to work. Now, on one level, if you were to Ask, say, the, the trade union lawyer might say, oh, well, Merger Properties was the one where they got the injunction, the picket was restricted because the court found that the women's right to earn a livelihood was being breached. But that's the point. It's just as Kenny in the High Court located the right which allowed him to restrict the picket in one of the unenumerated rights under Article 40, subsection 3, the right to earn a livelihood, assisted by the principles of social policy in Article 45. Um, so in this case, I've only got the right result. We closed down the picket. But he specifically refused to accept that they had the right to equality under the guarantee of equality that related in any way to uh, their trading activities or the conditions under which they worked. He said it was to do with their status as human persons. And to be honest, I've always struggled with people to understand what exactly that means. But there's a hell of a lot of things it clearly doesn't mean, and according to this case, it doesn't mean equality vis-a-vis -vis your right to working conditions. But the best part of this case, that it's like, you'd have to laugh because, you know, uh, otherwise it really is utterly tragic. When it became apparent that the judge was contemplating making a finding on the basis of the unenumerated right to earn a livelihood, counsel for the union said, Judge, you can't be doing that because that would render unconstitutional the state's system of unequal pay for men and women. So at the time, 
men and women were paid different rates of pay, including across all sectors of state employment there were female rates of pay and then higher male rates of pay. So one of the submissions made on behalf of the union was you can't make a finding that these women have a constitutional right to earn a livelihood because that undermines the entire state system of discriminatory pay, to which the, the judge, you know, quite clearly in one way in terms of getting to the end point, he said the right to earn a livelihood doesn't mean they have the right to earn a certain level of livelihood because that's a matter of the Iraqis. I'm simply deciding they have a right to earn a livelihood. And he also said that if the pickets had been because the work was considered to be dangerous for the women, that he might have actually um, not restricted the uh, pickets. So what he ended up with, albeit that the, the women's right to work was recognised, but at the same time, he, what you ended up with was a rejection of the Constitution recognising any right to equal pay or equal working conditions for women, and even their limited right to earn a livelihood could be lawfully restricted where the work was considered to be unsuitable for them. And emphasising the work of the fourth time, that's only a year before we uh, joined the European Union. So looking then to European equality law, before we look at the ta-da that happened in Ireland when we did join and how that impacted so heavily and changed society so radically, just looking at how equality developed uh, at an European level, um, whilst European law has undoubtedly had an immeasurable impact on Irish employment equality rights and unemployment equality rights across the entirety of the Union. In fact, the origins going way back to the Treaty, uh, the Treaty of Rome in 1957, there was little or no promotion of equality. And again, that's a little bit surprising because, as many of you will know, what was contained in the Treaty of Rome was Article 119, now 141, the right to equal pay for men and women. That's contained in the treaty. Now, the reason that went into the treaty was absolute political compromise because you had two of the leading um, sort of influencers on the content of the treaty was obviously France and Germany. France had a very progressive employment rights, including equal pay going back to the 1950s. They also had um, some of the best holiday pay and paid overtime rights. G generally, their employment and social rights would have been uh, one of the most, one of the best within the, the then communities. And they were very concerned about social dumping because obviously all of these enhanced rights meant it was more expensive to employ people in France than elsewhere. So they had obvious concerns within an economic community that there would be social dumping. Germany, on the other hand, uh, reckoned that the, the, the sort of rising tide would benefit everyone and that harmonisation of social costs would follow the common market. So they were all about the common market and everything else comes in behind that. It's all about the economy, don't mind about the, the social sort of side of things. So the result was the compromise. The preamble to the treaty talks about improving the quality of life for all peoples in the communities, and then Article 119 says all members of the communities are entitled to equal pay uh, for men and women, which looks fantastic. And it sat there from 1957 until 1976, doing absolutely nothing other than allowing the communities to present this supposed social soft piece that was utterly irrelevant in practice. And it's described by one of the commentators as a silent promise. But then, and this is, this is another, sort of, you know, I think this is a great one about how you, know, you all as lawyers really can change the world. Because that all obviously came about as a result of these massive political negotiations and you know, roomfuls of civil servants and compromise on compromise and compromise. And eventually in 1976, a Belgian heir of steps brought a very simple case of equal pay. Now, obviously, she was very brave and very courageous, but in reality, these, the, the individual that present as the case, they're simply the test case. The lawyers have been hunting around for a long time for the right test case, and it is the lawyers who bring these cases forward, fight them, and hear one uh, most simple case you can imagine of equal pay on the basis that Article 119 had direct effects. And of course, as you know from your study of European law, that means that every single citizen of the European communities could rely directly on Article 119. So overnight, every woman 
in the European communities was entitled to rely directly on Article 119 to secure their rights to uh, uh, equal pay. That resulted then obviously in the, the Equal Pay Directive followed by the Equal Treatment uh, uh, Directive. So, by the time we joined the European communities in 1973, equality is, is up and running. Um, and in fact, within a year, so we joined in 1973, and within a year, we have to implement equal pay. Now, now, if you look at, say, a year ago when the Gender Pay Gap Reporting Act was implemented, it's quite a technical point to do with Gender Pay Gap Reporting, but it is significant, and there's quite a fanfare about, you know, aren't we great? And it is great, it's really important, but it's almost, you know, we celebrate now anything that improves equality, obviously with due regard to the challenges that that can present for employers, um, but it is generally celebrated as a good thing. Uh, the sense you get when you look at the response in, so we joined the European Union, massive vote in favour of membership, particularly from the farm communities who couldn't get to the, the cap, the common agricultural policy quick enough, and it was fantastic. But the response was almost, ah, here, we joined the European Union communities because we're supposed to get loads of money, you're now telling us we're going to have to spend that money on recognising women's right to equal pay. And there was one sort of lobby group that basically said the cost of equal pay in the first year will outweigh the money we're going to get from Europe. So what's the point? So the idea of it being sort of social progress, it, it, there was quite a lot of resistance, um, but of course we had absolutely no choice. Having said that, it didn't stop the state, and this is a true story. Uh, one of the things they had to do in preparation for equal pay was come up with a system of implementing equal pay. So they came up with a civil service job of equal pay officers. The only thing these people had to do was to determine claims of equal pay. It's like an equal pay judge for all they've worked. And they put an ad in the paper looking for candidates for equal pay officers for the soon to be implemented equal pay act. And they advertised different rates of pay for men and women. <laughs> so, and so you can see that the the executive was struggling with what it meant to take on the responsibilities of European communities' membership. The judiciary also struggled. Um, initially, there was little or no tradition of referring cases to Luxembourg. I mean, I assume, I've never actually had a chance to ever sort of ask anyone who was around at that time, but I assume there was a flurry of, of training. But even then, the idea of judicial training would have been quite radical. Um, uh, there would have been very little expertise in the universities of European law. You know, certainly wouldn't have been now every single graduate, I presume, correct me if I'm wrong, and certainly those of you who graduated pure law will have done at least one component of European law, and I expect those of you who uh, uh, are studying law and something else, there's probably some mandatory European law element to it. So you're not going to get an Irish lawyer now who doesn't have some understanding of European law, and absolutely at the top of that understanding is the notion of the hierarchy of European law, uh, where it comes within the, the, the competence, and that is now part of our, our DNA as Irish lawyers. But obviously at the time it must have been enormously difficult for people to understand that, even though they would be well used to the idea of the Constitution being at the, the right, so really, there's not that much difference in practice between the idea of national law has to be consistent with European law as compared to the principle of law they would be used to, that, that the law has to be consistent with the constitution. But the judiciary uh, definitely, I think, struggled. Very few references. In fact, in our first 30 years of membership, between 1973 and 2003, the Irish court referred the smallest number of references per head of population uh, across the entire of the communities. Um, and I remember one of my first time I went to the Court of Justice when it was uh, 2000, uh, 2000 and something, and it was something like the, the, it was less than 50. Even at that stage, we were the not quite 50 of case to, to go out. So they were tiny numbers. I mean, obviously, a lot more now, partly because I think very possibly that's been partly fed into by uh, asylum law, the development of asylum law, and an awful lot of references coming from that area. But you even see in employment law just a greater willingness to look at the idea of securing a reference and that you the years of recognition that that reference didn't actually have to come from the High Court, it could come even from the Labour Court, even from uh, the Welsh of the URC. Um, so that's been a, a sort of an evolution. 
But not only at the time could you see the judiciary struggling with even the concept of making a reference, uh, they clearly struggled with what European equality law meant. And there's a very good case that illustrates that case of Murphy on a board telecom. And it's 1986, you know, 13 years uh, after our membership, and the High Court actually referred a case to Luxembourg. Uh, the, the, it was established that the claimant's an equal pay case. And this woman was looking for, she was being paid less than her male counterpart. The problem that the court encountered, so much so that it had to ask Luxembourg to assist it, was it was accepted that her work was not of equal value to her male counterpart who was being paid more. It was of greater value. Everybody accepted that her work was of greater value than her male comparator. And the High Court had to refer the case to Luxembourg to say, well, does that person get equal pay? And the Court of Justice said, yeah, um, doesn't get, there's no entitlement to a higher level of pay, but there is obviously a right to equal pay, and you do get, and you know yourselves in reading the decisions of the Court of Justice, they don't really hold back. And there is a sense in that decision of, really? So I highlight that as just showing that oh, during the 70s and the 80s, there was definitely a struggle both from the executive and from the uh, 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 judiciary in understanding what our membership of the European Union meant and what this radical, new, vast range of life-altering employment equality law uh, uh, meant for the law. But moving on then, so we move further into the 80s and into the 90s, you then start to see, it's like they sort of said, gosh, this is really cool, we're really going to go for this. And there's two areas, I think, uh, Ireland actually became the absolute, you know, best uh, people in the class in, in terms of using the legislation they, that, that the Irish legislation intended to transpose your, the European directives and Article 119 and all of that, and in, in actually an incredibly progressive way, and a great illustration of that is in uh, sexual harassment. Sexual harassment is an area that the law really, really struggled with, so much so that in 1983, a leading UK academic did a survey of a number of UK lawyers, and a significant number of them said that in their view, sexual harassment was not outlawed by the then uh, UK sex discrimination legislation. Uh, because none of the legislation mentioned sexual harassment. I mean, remember, sexual harassment was something originally developed by the uh, feminist lawyer Catherine McKinnon in the States in 1976 when it was previously known as the problem without a name. And she coined the phrase sexual harassment in 1976. So the law really struggled with sexual harassment um, and really struggled with the idea that, that sexually harassing somebody on grounds of their gender, sexually harassing a woman because she was a woman, was contrary to equal treatment legislation, even though that legislation doesn't identify what sexual harassment is. So the entire of the European community was struggling with this. The entire of the European communities had the equivalent of our Employment Equality Act, which was implementing the Equal Treatment Directive, which recognised the right to equal treatment, but didn't define or address sexual harassment in any way. And Ireland was actually uh, not quite the first, we were actually beaten ironically by a case in Northern Ireland. So we take the, uh, uh, the we could take the state as a 30, or the, the, the island as a 32 county island, but we can't take it as a single jurisdiction. So the first case in the entire of the European communities to use the legislation that transposed the directive to outlaw sexual harassment was actually Northern Ireland case. Uh, but it wasn't the clearest, it wasn't the next case was in the 80s, there was a decision at the Labour Court. Um, at the time, the only to date female chair of the Labour Court, first and only female chair of the Labour Court, a woman called Evans Owens, handed down the decision, and again, in its simplicity, and she said quite simply, freedom from sexual harassment is a condition of work which an employee of either sex is entitled to expect. The court would accordingly treat any denial of that freedom as discrimination within the terms of the Employment Equality Act 1977, full stop. It's probably the widest breadth uh, recognition of the right to a workplace to be free from sexual harassment that has ever been espoused in Irish law. Because since it has more recently been put onto a statutory footing, it has actually a lot more restrictions have been applied. Now, realistically, that going that way really probably isn't workable. But it's interesting that all of the legislative provisions since then 
have imposed some limitations. You know, it's a sort of a partly objective, partly subjective approach. Uh, this might not be sexual harassment, this might be all of that. But to think that that first time it's recognised, it is recognised in the most fulsome way. And even though that was a very modest, almost like a modest little case down in the Labour Court, and I can tell you at the time, uh, well, by the time I started in practice in the 90s, what went on down in the Labour Court, nobody was really terribly interested in it. It wasn't headline news. Um, so it was almost this past under the radar, but it was phenomenal and of phenomenal importance in using the legislation that transposed the European Directive to outlaw sexual harassment. And it wasn't until the recast directive in 2006 that the European Commission finally put sexual harassment on a statutory footing, actually introduced a recast directive, a definition of sexual harassment, and specifically outlawed sexual harassment within the equality uh, directives. And at the time when the recast directive was introduced, Ireland was still one of a very small number of member states who had developed its own legislation to outlaw sexual harassment. Um, Pregnancy is another area where, again, shock horror, and it really is quite surprising, uh, we were a little more radical. The law has also enormously struggled with pregnancy discrimination. Thankfully not now, it's now much more heavily protected, very heavily protected during the period of pregnancy and statute of maternity leave. The protection is way after that, but for that period of time, heavily protected. But before that was eventually introduced by a decision of the Court of Justice, again, like the Belgian air hostess, uh, this was a case that was brought by an individual and somewhere that there was a really hot Dutch legal team that actually created this phenomenal change uh, in European law that had this impact across the entire European community. So that's what you can all aspire to, being part of a legal team like that. Uh, and the Decker decision was in 19... Now it's 94, but again, so quite uh, far out. But finally, it was recognised, very simple decision, finally recognised that to treat a woman less favourably on grounds of her pregnancy is direct discrimination on grounds of her sex. And it is, it's almost like, yeah, um, but the law struggled phenomenally with that prior to the Decker decision. Now remember, it's like the way. Direct discrimination is the strongest protection possible. There's also indirect discrimination, which is pretty good, but it can be justified. So it's a weaker form of protection. So the Court of Justice pitched pregnancy uh, discrimination at the absolute top of the food chain. Prior to that, and there's a UK case, an infamous UK case, where, honest to God, with a straight face, a judge described the reason he said pregnancy discrimination is not gender discrimination. Because the thing is, there's actually three kinds of people. There are men, there are women, and then, he said, as the good book puts it, there are women with child. So, to treat a woman with child less favourably is not because she's a woman, it's because she's a woman with child, so it's not discrimination around the sex. So, that was the prevalent attitude in the UK. They did eventually work up to this idea of the sick male analogy. So, if a pregnant woman was dismissed, which was not unusual, uh, if she could prove that a man with an illness who had to take a period of time off work of a similar period that she'd have to take for her maternity leave was also dismissed, then she would win her case. So it became known as the sick male analogy, utterly artificial, extremely difficult even to identify male-only conditions, and extremely difficult to locate an employer who would actually pay a man for that period of time. That's as far as the law went in the UK. But actually in Ireland, we didn't get to the point of Decker recognising direct discrimination but we did recognise that a requirement not to be pregnant, because if you think about it, if you've been dismissed because you're pregnant, then the requirement to hold on to your job is not to be pregnant. The Irish courts recognised that a requirement not to be pregnant was indirect discrimination because it impacted more heavily on women. There are less women who could comply with that condition than men. So the Irish courts had actually recognised pregnancy discrimination as indirect discrimination. Not as good as Decker, that the Court of Justice eventually recognised and really shook up the whole area of pregnancy discrimination, but pretty good in the context in which the law was elsewhere at the time. So again, I refer to that as an example of how the judiciary were actually taking quite a, a sort of a radical approach. And the other really radical approach that happened in Ireland in terms of employment equality was to extend the protection 
beyond, they, they, your in-law had always been about discrimination around gender and marriage, and that was it. Um, so eventually, as a result of the Treaty of Amsterdam, uh, the, 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 what are known as the new grounds or the new directives began to be introduced in uh, the uh, uh, 2000s. Um, but well before that, so in 1998, the Rainbow Coalition government introduced what was a very radical legislation, very, very simple legislation. It simply took the protection that had previously been applied to gender and marital status and said we're going to extend that to seven new grounds. And I always fall for a little bit, I'm not being able to remember all of them. But there was race, uh, still is, was is race, disability, sexual orientation, religion, membership of the traveller community, age, I always miss one, so very many quality lawyers who, and some family status. Um, so that was really quite radical at the time. The new grounds were being discussed at a European level, but were still utterly in their infancy. And ironically, it was just a, sort of a bittersweet irony, very sweet, which is a bittersweet, a sweet irony, that when uh, the, the, the new grounds were introduced, uh, uh, in Europe, they were actually looking to the Irish equality lawyers because at that stage we had not only had we had the legislation since 98, but we built up a jurisprudence on dealing with these for quite new issues within the framework of uh, uh, legislation that was very much formulated around European law principles. So we had all of the principles of direct discrimination, indirect discrimination, shifting burden of proof, all the European law. Basically, we had the jurisprudence that they were about to, to develop. So there was literally a, a, a look towards Irish employment equality lawyers being called on left, right, and centre to present papers uh, uh, at the European level because we had developed that expertise. So there are just three examples of where, you know, ironically, having been dragged initially kicking and screaming uh, towards uh, to, to recognising our obligations of European. Uh, membership, including the commitment to employment equality, to actually sort of coming full circle, to actually taking on board uh, those principles enthusiastically and, and providing leadership in them. Now, since then, uh, we've more been on catch up rather than sort of setting leadership. And most of the more recent developments around equality, uh, like work balance directive, the pregnancy directive, various other directives, we have. Like most European law obligations that we have, we've tagged behind a little bit. We usually transpose at least within the period of time that we're allowed, maybe even a little bit late. But interestingly, just last week, the Commission uh, published the Pay Transparency Directive that came into force two weeks ago. And one of the most, the most recent, very powerful, very significant, quite sort of technical, but very significant in terms of trying to challenge the gender pay gap. And it allows three weeks, three years of transposition. It provides for mandatory gender pay gap reporting, pre employment pay transparency obligations, employee information rights to pay data, and a ban on pay secrecy clauses. Basically, it means that uh, when you go for a job, you're entitled to be told what the rate of pay is for your colleagues. And I think, even culturally, that's something that's quite strange in Ireland. You know, we consider it awfully bad manners to acquire what somebody is being paid, which isn't something that's discussed. And that's hugely unhelpful in terms of trying to beat, to, to deal with what is still a significant gender pay gap. But interestingly, the gender pay gap reporting piece, which is a really important part of that directive, we've had that in Irish law since, 19, since 2021, way before it was required of us. And I'm sure many of you have even seen in the newspaper, the gender pay gap. Um, and you see it now on company websites. It's one of the, the pieces, you know, uh, where you'll actually see click here for the gender pay gap information um, and it has been uh, a source of some celebration for some organisations to say look at our fantastic narrow gender pay gap, highly embarrassing for some other organisations. So it's, it's quite effective, it's very important and a good example of, you know, Ireland is still being just a little bit ahead of the curve, not as often but, but very much there. So just drawing my thoughts to the close, um, I suppose when we look at the, the narrative of Irish employment equality law, we see initially a very traditional society in which discrimination against women was tolerated and was lawful. And that moved almost full circle to the state, both its legislative and its judicial arms, engaging in, I think, really quite genuine attempts to try to promote equality in the workplace, with the result that Irish women now participate 
far more equally in civil society and in the workplace than they did in the 1970s. But clearly not enough as a cursory glance at two really important professions, the legal profession and the political profession will tell you. The rates of female participation at a senior level uh, are still extremely poor. I think on the bench we're, we're respectable, not there, but respectable, but when you look at the numbers of the NOR, that's when it's really bad. And unfortunately, uh, every time we have new appointments, are fantastic, and we've got excellent new appointments last week, and it is now you know, five of them. We're always going to have a number of women. The day of only men being appointed to the bench is well gone. The women who are appointed actually needs quite a significant dent in the numbers of the NOR because those numbers are, are very poor. Only hit 20% for the first time, I think, about, about a year ago. And uh, at a political level, membership of the Doyle, the Senate, and the government is, is really very, very poor. So a lot done, with a lot more to do. Gender pay gap is still a stark reality. Those who choose to have children and wish to maintain a career continue to experience hugely negative consequences on their career as a result of having children. And uh, women and members of minority groups continue to experience harassment in, of all types in the workplace and beyond. So, looking ahead and looking to you, it is the law and it is those who craft the law, those who work the law, and those who interpret and apply the law who have and will continue to create greater and real equality in our still unequal, but not as unequal as before society. Thank you.